This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're continuing uh, in our study of the, the book of John. Uh, we're going to pick up with uh, in chapter 3, verse 19. Uh, if you have not seen the previous studies, uh, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Particularly the, uh, the first half of chapter 1 is one of the most important um, portions of the whole Bible. And then also all of chapter 3. And what you've missed, we're going to verse 19 now, but the first 18 verses are just incredible, and they're very important. So I hope you will go back and watch the whole thing from the beginning. Uh, those videos are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, before we get started, let me ask uh, Brother Eric to say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. It's me again, the Holmo. And uh, just type that in anywhere and you'll uh be able to see for yourself okay love you back to you yeah i think it's uh worth repeating uh what we we're talking about before we went live there about uh you leading two people to the lord today and how simple it was uh because m most people are they don't understand uh, how to even get on the subject they, and and then and then they're too timid and, and af afraid about being maybe being rejected. Uh, but if someone does reject you, it's not rejecting you, it's rejecting uh, the, the gospel, rejecting Jesus. But you you just simply said to these people, you just encountered them, you didn't know them, and you said, do you, do you want to live forever in paradise? <laughs> they said, yeah. I mean, who would say no to that? Uh, and so it just took you after that, just a moment to tell them the, the good news. And so that's, I'm just really, happy about that brother your your boldness your availability uh readiness at all times to tell people about jesus we'll, we'll go ahead into the study now but anything you want to say about that well thank you brother luke and uh, i would like to teach my methods to uh all the 144,000 uh that are going to be sent out but i've got to get it Long Ranger approved first. Okay, back to you. All right. So we're uh, going to read in the KJV first uh, because I'm a KJV firstist. And then we will probably look closely at the, these verses again in the Amplified because it's it amplifies it. And it's, it's like reading a commentary. So verse 19 says, And... And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Uh, I'm looking at it in the Amplified right now just because I wanted to see. Uh, the Amplified has it in red letters. And, you know, red letter uh, printing in the Bible means that they believe those are the direct words of Jesus. And uh, I'm trying to find verse 19 here. Uh, in verse 19 in the Amplified, uh, yeah, they have that as in red. So they're saying that these are the words of Jesus. Verse 18, let me see verse 18 that we went through before, last time. Uh, well, actually, all of this, wow, that's really interesting. The, all these verses from John. Um, uh, Are they paraphrased? Well, the, the paraphrased part is not uh, in, in black, in, in red. That's just, that's their uh, addition to it. But the actual words are in red. Uh, and it's all the way from... Uh, you know, much of this whole chapter is in red, and, and uh, particularly. What, uh, what uh, manuscript did they use to? Uh, you know what I'm saying? What? No, I don't. I don't. I don't know which is their uh, their uh, source of manuscripts they used. Uh, but uh, it, the interesting thing is that they believe that these are all the direct words of Jesus, and some people might argue that 
this is John recounting what happened and John or the Holy Spirit saying this, but not the words of Jesus. But I don't see any reason. I, I, first, first of all, I know this is the word of Jesus in th verse 13. He, he's in verse 12. No, verse 11. In verse 10. Yeah, it's clear all of this. It says, Jesus answered and said unto him. And then verse, he's still talking all this time, all through all these verses here. Uh, verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted. It's clear that all, these are all the words of D Jesus, but I hadn't really thought about that before. To, to that, that is important that these words are coming directly from him. And these are the, it's the beginning of the believe verses in John, because there's 99 believe uh, statements in, in the Gospel of John. <clears throat> and so uh, this is Jesus same believe. So I'll read this again, and then let me get re your reaction to it. Verse 19, it says, and this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Brother, what do you say about that? Um, I'm a little bit confused. What exactly is the condemnation? Well, let's go back. Let's go back. It says in verse um, 18, it says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So Jesus is saying, if you believe in him, you're not condemned. But if you don't ever believe in him, then you are you were already condemned from the beginning because you've never believed in the name of the Son of God, and um, we know that uh, uh, in in so far in this chapter he didn't elaborate on what condemned means, and a lot of people can even debate what condemned means. But we, we let's just suffice it for now to say you're not going to go to heaven if you're condemned. Uh, but it, but if you believe in Jesus, you're not condemned. Therefore, you do get to go to heaven. And so uh, in verse 19, he said, and this is the condemn condemnation, that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. So what's your response to verse 19? Uh, well, Brother Luke, uh, I just uh, noted the condemnation is mentioned in uh, John 3.16. And that condemnation is uh, to perish. Hello, Stephen. I'm hey so there. glad to see you. Hey, I got to turn my uh, editing on here. I forgot to turn it on because I don't let just anybody come in here. They got to be approved. So I've got that set up now. But of course, uh, Stephen is approved. Hi, hello, brother. How are you doing tonight? Uh, great. Just got back from a Young Life session. From a um, Christian club to a Bible study. Well, I'd say what a wonderful day you're having then, huh? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to read this. Uh, we're in uh, John chapter 3, verse 19. And did you hear the first couple of minutes? You know what we've said so far? Uh, I would. I looked on YouTube for a second before I got here, but in reality, I kind of really just jumped in. Okay. Just you now, haven't, but but you we're in missed. verse 18 as far as I could see. Uh, no, we're on verse 19 now. I just read it in the KJV, so I'm going to read verse 19 in the Amplified. And it says, uh, this is the judgment that is the cause for indictment, the test by which people are judged, the basis for the sentence. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. So I think the way they expounded on it and amplified it, when it says this is the condemnation, they say this is the judgment, but but in terms of the judgment, they, they define that as the cause for indictment, the test by which people are judged, the basis for the sentence. So the basis for the sentence, yeah. Well, we know that uh, I found that there's a lot of confusion in the world that pe people think that people go to hell because of sin. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people, if you just ask them, even if they're fairly 
you know, uh, educated in the Bible, they they still believe that we believe in Jesus and we don't we don't our sins are forgiven. We don't we get to go to heaven. If you don't believe in Jesus, the reason you go to hell is because your sins your your sins are not forgiven. Uh, but the Bible says that he he's the propitiation for our sins. He died for our sins, not only ours, but for the sins of the whole world. So if we believe that um, there is universal atonement, that the death of Jesus served as the payment for everybody's sins, that means even atheists, even Muslims, he died for their sins too, then... The reason people go to heaven is not go to hell is not because of sin, because Jesus died for their sins. The reason they go to to hell is because of unbelief in Jesus, and that's what this verse is telling us, and that's what it says in the Amplified. Let me read it again, the Amplified, then let get your reaction to it. It says, um, "This is the judgment." Now, in the King James, the word is condemnation. This is the condemnation, and they explain it. That is the cause for indictment, the test by which people are judged, the basis for the sentence. I think that's referring to the point I just made. The, the, the reason people are indicted, the reason they're found lacking, is because they did not believe in Jesus. And it says, the light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Okay, what's your response to that? Uh, I'm still trying to correlate it to uh, unbelief. All you got to do is look at verse 18. Remember, we, we went back to that, and it said in verse 18, it says, He that believeth, see, this is, this is believing. It says, if you believe, you're not condemned. If you never believe, you, you are condemned. So that's the basis. The basis is uh, belief or unbelief. Okay, uh, that's not going to set up any uh, contro, uh, contradictions with the writings of Paul, who says that uh, all liars and blah, 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 and such and such, and on and on, uh, shall have their part in the lake of fire. Uh, and all of those verses that... Uh, carry that same uh, uh, thought, what would you uh, have to say to that? Well, it, it's true. Uh, all liars, all, all adulterers, all blasphemers, all, all sinners go to hell. That's, that's why they, you, uh, Jesus is necessary. Uh, we were all on our way to hell. We, hell is, is the... Uh, uh, the destination for all of mankind until God said, I will remedy it by sending my son. So he died for the sins, and now, even though uh, I, I, I'm a liar and I'm a thief and, I, and I've done all kinds of bad things in my life, uh, just as it says there, all liars go to hell. Well, I should be going to hell, but I'm not because I did the one thing God required. I believe on Jesus. Okay, um, Brother Stephen, what's your response to all this? Well, my response to looking at verse 19 is, as it says here, this is the condemnation that light come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. I mean, I see it as, you know, the light has come into the world. Well, Jesus came, you know, to die in our place, to take our sins, you know, and to be the sacrifice for us, you know, the only spotless Lamb of God. And But people... Loving darkness rather than light. It's instead of choosing to, you know, believe in Him and follow Him as you know as He asks you to. Well, believing for salvation, of course. Like they're choosing to do it like their own way, you know, work their way in, and you know, like pretty much follow to the law. And when I see like their deeds are evil, I guess well, how that correlates to the law is kind of like how like the Pharisees are. Like they're like lifting the law, but yet. In reality, the whole time they're conspiring to kill Jesus the whole time. Like their hearts were evil and they're very self-conceited and all they're trying to do is just get praise from people. Yeah, the, the, the insight you provided reminds me of the, uh, the verse, I think it's in Matthew 7, 
uh, where um, the, the people come to Jesus and, and they say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these wonderful things in your name? We did this and we did that and, and uh, all the wonderful works we did in, for in your name. And Jesus says, depart from me, worker of iniquity. He calls them worker of iniquity. They did all kinds of good works. So uh, they, but but he considers their works to be it, workers of iniquity, wicked, it's wickedness. Um, because, oh, yeah, because they they didn't do the one thing that he wanted them to do, and that's trust him. Instead, they're pleading their case. I've given this example so many times over the years. Um, most people think that when you die and you go before God and he judges you, you plead your case and you say, uh, I went to church and I, I, I was charitable and I did good deeds. And they plead their case based upon uh, the things that they did. They're trying to be justified by their own works. But as Jesus says, worker of iniquity, that your works are like filthy rags. Why didn't you put your faith in me instead of your works? Depart from me. I never knew you. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, and of course, that's going to leave a lot of people, you know, like lordship salvationists to like gasp because like they will have, you know, worked themselves, you know, to death trying to get their salvation and to be good enough and to justify. But, you know, this is kind of skipping a little bit ahead. As you remember looking at John 6, I'm just going to read verses 28 and 29. Then they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. And it's like all these people back in the verse that you mentioned, they were all trying to use their own righteousness to get to heaven. You know, And they were like pretty much, it's like the Pharisees, bragging on their own works, you know, thinking that that would be good enough instead of just coming to Jesus and believe. And, you know, coming, you know, because as Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no man may come to the Father but by me. They're trying to forge their own way rather than come to him, than do the real work of God, which is to believe, which Jesus said. Amen. Uh, I've always found it really ironic that uh, the verse I quoted in or, or paraphrased in uh, Matthew, Lord, Lord. Didn't we do all these wonderful works in your name? Uh, that that portion of scriptures, the Lordship Salvationists quote that to justify Lordship Salvation. And, it, and it's exactly the opposite of the way they understand it. Uh, it's condemning people come, uh, you know, per, trying to be justified by their works. Uh, and... Uh, but they use it to, to make the case that, look at all the wonderful works I did in your name. Well, they're saying, well, these people didn't do enough. They did works, but they didn't do enough. That's why you better really, really get serious about your works, you know. Uh, really make Jesus your Lord. Really, you know, uh, surrender your whole life over to him. Otherwise, he'll, he'll say, depart from me. Uh, so the very verses that condemn lordship salvation, they think it supports it. <laughs> Yeah, like, because Jesus says it is the ones who do the will of my Father. And I think that's the part they really, like, twist because they really think that, like, it's like what you said. Like, they haven't, like, haven't made Jesus Lord enough or haven't done it with a 100% heart or haven't just gone at it 100%, have been 100% sinless or 100% perfect, as you'll see by many, you know, quote, you know, false prophets and by, you know, many lordship salvationists. Of course, I've known a few in my past, but, you know, I already just told you what the will of, you know, God was, which was to believe on him whom we have sent. And, you know, that's the only way we'll be justified. It's like they – and they also will think about certain verses where Jesus said that they will – that he will reward every man according to his works and or the verse saying that faith without works is dead. Like they'll go after those verses to justify it, you know, rather than just coming to Jesus and doing the real work of God, which is just believing. You know, that's all he you know, that's all Jesus asked for us. Verily, verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Okay. Um, I have something I'd like to say about that, but I want Brother Eric to get stick his stick his nose in here and I want to hear his two cents worth. Oh, thank you guys very much. Very well put. Excellent work. 
unfortunately, uh, they will not hear us. Uh, I want a better. I want a method of uh, shutting them down, so they'll stop preaching that false gospel. Okay, back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the uh, the verse you quoted in John six. Um, uh, what, what works must we do to do the works of God? And Jesus said, this is the work of God, that ye believe in the one he sent. Um, and then we have verses that say uh, that uh, uh, you're not saved by your works. You're saved by grace, uh, so that no one can boast. Uh, you're saved by faith and grace. So uh, we, we all agree that... Um, uh, it's it's uh, completely by grace and faith, and that salvation is a free gift. Our works do not factor in at all. We don't we don't have to do even one work. Uh, even the verse that says, "To the man who worketh not, but believeth in the one who justified the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness." To the man who worketh not, I mean that means to me he didn't do one work at all. And so if a person does zero work but trusts Jesus, then they're going to go to heaven. But then we have this verse in John that you quoted, and it seems to see that believing in Jesus is, is a work. Uh, but the way, I, the way I see that is, I mean, some people say that the verse actually says, Jesus says, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he sent, the work of God. So... Sometimes a Calvinist will use that verse to say, see, it's the work of God. It's all God making you believe. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would say this is the work that God wants you to do. This is the, instead of work, though, it could be translated, this is the one thing. This is the one requirement. You don't have to join a religion and become religious and follow religious rules. There's one thing you are required to do. Just one. Believe in Jesus. So, in a way, it's unfortunate that the word work is in that verse. But... That's why I uh, I was in a hangout earlier listening for a while to somebody talk and I, I never got a chance to say anything but I was I, the point I wanted to make I'll make right now because because if now it's relevant again and that is that um, there's there's this argument they call it monergism or synergism monergism is just simply that man doesn't do anything God does it all man doesn't even choose to believe God makes him believe and that's Calvinism so God does everything it's, it's completely one way God does it all man plays no part in it and then synergism is that, that there's God does one thing he, he he's gracious and and we do the other thing we're we have faith uh, he's gracious enough to give us salvation if we will have faith so God has his part is grace our part is faith uh, but uh, the problem is that the, the Calvinists argue that uh, you're, you're stealing glory from God if you, if you think that uh, you're doing something like, okay, I'm choosing to believe, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm able to take some credit for, for this salvation because I did something good and now I deserve it. Uh, now, I also believe in sola gloria, and I believe all the five solas, Sola Gloria means that uh, we've got to make sure that Jesus gets all the glory. We don't want to steal glory from Jesus like the Lordship Salvationists do. They're boasting about their works and stealing glory from him because they're trying to, uh, as it says in Paul, lest any man should boast. But doesn't a Lordship Salvationist have to boast saying uh, salvation is based upon how much I do too? So we, we want Jesus to get all the glory and say, we agree that uh, our works do not factor into our salvation. Jesus gets all the glory. Uh, but is are we stealing glory from Jesus if we say that uh, faith, believing is a work? Well, I would. that's why I like the term that I adopted a, couple, a few days ago. I made a video. Um, um, what is it? Free, free gift theology. Free gift theology. Now, we're used to using the term free grace theology, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's true. Uh, theology of free grace is true. I believe it. 
But the problem with, with free grace is a lot of people don't understand it. It, it requires an ex, much of an explanation. But free gift theology is real simple. That, see, if, uh, if I buy a gift and wrap it up and present it and I offer it to you, uh, and then Eric, you, you, you accept the gift, who gets the glory? Uh, you? Yeah, just because you accept the gift, why, why does a person accepting a gift get any glory? All the glory go, goes to the one that bought it, worked for it, prepared it, and, and offered it to you. That person gets all the glory. There's no glory in accepting the gift. So uh, that's why this idea of, um, of uh, in the verse in John that Stephen quoted, uh, this is the work of God that you believe in the one he sent is that uh, um, uh, our part is the part that's required of us is just to believe in Jesus and just because we believed in Jesus and we did something in other words God does it does everything all we have to do is believe and the fact that we ch chose to believe it doesn't steal any of his glory it's no it's no more stealing glory from Jesus in that way than if he offered he gives us a gift all wrapped up with a bow and all we do is accept it how am I taking any glory from the gift giver because I accepted it Do you see the importance of that is it okay if I glory in the gift that's where we should do it. We should boast on Jesus, not boast on ourselves. Stephen, are you still there? Oh, yeah, I am. Okay. Any comment before we move on? I mean, yeah, I do like that analogy about like the buying the gift, you know, and presenting it and like gift wrapping it, because you know that's what Jesus did. You know, he's the one who bought us our gift of salvation with his life. And by shedding his blood and, you know, and by him fulfilling the law and him being pleasing to God, you know, he did it all. And then he offered us the gift. So, I mean, literally all the thanks to, of any gift goes to the giver. So all of our thanks, all of our praise, you know, goes to Jesus and Jesus alone and not us or, you know, anything that we do. And which you will not see in a lordship salvationist crowd because they're all trying to compare themselves to each other. And it's like a holier than thou movement sometimes. Okay, guys, that was verse 19. Let's go on to verse 20 now. Uh, in the KJV, it says, For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Uh, this is still Jesus talking here in this verse. Uh, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Um, I really like the, the, the concept of the light and the darkness. Um, it's like, remember I was talking about martial arts in the show last night, brother, and I talked about how I, I practiced martial arts by pulling into the parking lot and looking for a lighted area so I could park my car where the light was. Yes, uh, absolutely. Great yeah. story. Because because the the criminals they want to avoid the light. They hide in the darkness. If if you put light on, they're exposed. It's like turning the light on and all the cockroaches flee and run into the cracks of the walls. You know, instead of the light exposes them. And so uh, that's what this is really to me telling me is that uh, you know that when when. When we talk about Jesus and, and what we listen to what Jesus said, we, and we listen to this this gospel, this uh, this beautiful salvation, it's light. And uh, some people they don't want to be in the light because it, it exposes them. They're exposed in the light. And you know sometimes though people get exposed in the light and and they feel contrite, and they 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 come to their senses and say. Uh, yeah, the light has exposed me. I recognize who I am, and I recognize why I need Jesus now. I'll go to the Amplified, but what's your response to that so far? Wow, that's great. Wonderful. And uh, 
I'd like to mention also that light destroys the darkness. Okay, back to you. Um, I think that uh, I forgot how it was stated. What I that there really is a, how do they phrase it? Darkness. There's really no such thing as darkness. Darkness is just absence of light. So you have light, and when they, there's no absence, and when the light is gone, we th we think it's darkness, but it's really just absence of light. Um, so, uh, okay, before we go on, Brother Stephen, anything to be said about that verse? Um, yeah, I think it's just for me... When looking at it, for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, and neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. When I look at that verse, I guess it again kind of reminds me of the like lordship, salvations, you know, slash Pharisee crowd, because it really kind of, I guess, shows off like the conditions like of their heart. Because instead of being willing to come to Jesus, they're still just wanting to do it their own way and being justified their own way and like Jesus was exposing them you know for wanting to just be self-righteous and wanting to get praise from other people you know rather than you know actually turn to God and turn to him you know and believe it's interesting how you are uh, responding to the these verses uh, we we all bring something in with us when we come to the scriptures. We bring our life's experiences. We bring our um, preconceived ideas, our, our doctrines, and then we look through it through that lens. And uh, script, scriptures can be really interpreted in more than one way. You have a, uh, a literal uh, historical interpretation uh, and you have a spiritual interpretation and, and then you can also have a personal and now sometimes what Stephen comes to his mind when he reads the verse is, is maybe different than what comes to my mind and why is that because his experience recently has been Lordship Salvation dealing with these people so much that that's what's on his mind, and when he reads the verse, that's what the verse uh, he sees in the verse. Uh, and and all of these things are, are valid. Um, but I, when the way you introduced Lordship Salvation to these last two verses, I I wouldn't have done that. But I'm not, I'm you're not wrong. You're right. But but it's it's you're seeing it from a perspective for, based upon your recent experiences. Let me read that in the Amplify verse twenty. For every wrongdoer hates the light and does not come to the light, but shrinks from it for fear that his sinful, worthless activities will be exposed and condemned. Okay, nothing really new in there. That nothing uh, that to really add, I don't think, to what the KJV said. Now let me go on to verse 21 in the KJV. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Um, okay, this the next verse moves on to something else. So let's take a minute and look at verse 21 uh, deeply here. I'll read it again and let me get your reaction. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Okay, uh, Brother Eric? I was just thinking, uh, I'll bet you anything that a Calvinist just loves that verse. What do you think? Another another example of what I just said. I, I wouldn't have thought of that. I wouldn't have connected Calvinism to to, to that. But uh, you know, since you brought it up, I can see, 
I can see how it could be. I'll read it in the Amplified. It says, but whoever practices truth and does what is right morally, ethically, spiritually comes to the light so that his works may be plainly shown to be what they are accomplished in God. Uh, so they might think that's accomplished by God uh, they, or that uh, they, uh, they're being compelled to come into the light because God is forcing them to do it. You know, that, that's what, how maybe a Calvinist would try to force that into it. But to me, uh, well, let me, before I talk, let me ask Brother Stevens' reaction to it. Well, looking at verse 21, But he that doeth truth cometh to the life, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You know, when I see this, I know I'm looking at it right now. I'm not looking at the camera, but when I see this, it's the ones who really, you know, seek after Jesus and seek after God, you know, come to Jesus to be justified. You know, that as it says here, that their deeds may be manifest and rotten God, that they may be justified, you know, in God's eyes through Jesus and not of their own way. You know, coming to the truth, which is Jesus, and that only he can save them and not their own works. You know, and not having that greedy heart, but actually seeking the Lord Jesus. Yeah. All right. I... I'm, I'm going to look at it again, the Amplified, and then talk about it for a moment. It, it says, but whoever practices truth, and, and that uh, in verse, in, in KJV says, but, but he that doeth truth. So the Amplified uh, translates it, practices truth. Uh, and does what is right morally, ethically, and spiritually. So if you're doing good, good things, you're living a moral life, and in trying to avoid sin, and it's, you, you come to the light so that his works may be plainly shown what they are uh, accomplished in God. Uh, and then he, they expounded, it says, divinely prompted, done with God's help, in dependence on him. Now that part I particularly like because the uh, that's the way I see, well, first of all, let me start off by saying that the... Uh, uh, when we when we do the right things in life, and you know, we we all have to confess that uh, before we got saved, we weren't perfect, and after we got saved, we're still not perfect. Uh, we're, we're we were not sinless before. We are not sinless now, but hopefully, we do sin less, and 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 it's not because of I know that my life has changed a lot. In 29 years, uh, if people that have known me all that time uh, were to talk about my life before and after, my life has changed a lot. It changed quite a bit immediately. But then it changed a lot more over the years. And I've had peaks and valleys because I think uh, spiritual growth and maturity uh, is a process whereby we are Growing and backsliding, growing and backsliding, growing. We're never static, I don't think. Our, our, our maturity level is never static. We're either growing or we're backsliding a little bit, depending upon how much time and thought we have on the Lord. Uh, but the changes in my life, I can go into the light. I can have people examine my life. I know that they'll see that I'm not perfect. Uh, I might pass a lot of people's scrutiny uh, pretty well, and other people, if they dig enough, if they really, really examine, they'll find I still have some faults. Uh, but I can go into the light and, and, and be exposed to the light because the Lord is transforming me, and people can see it. However, it's not me that's doing the work. It's the Holy Spirit that's transforming me. And that's why I like the way that it's in the KJV, it says it's wrought in God. In the Amplified, it, it phrases it differently that you it, the work was, how did, let me make sure I say it correctly, because they said it so well. It says, divinely prompted, done with God's help, independence on Him. 
So this is something I think that you know I've come to understand, and I hope more people will learn this, that um, when we get saved, our lives do change. Some change from here to here, like immediately. Others don't seem to change very much, but it's gradual. And, and others change a lot, but it's gradual. Uh, we're unique. Not everybody grows mature and mature spiritually the same. But the, the, the maturity that we do get in Christ is, is wrought by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is doing the work to transform us. The question is, some, will you listen to the Spirit? Or will you resist the Spirit? Because the Spirit is talking to all of us all the time. The Spirit lives in all believers. The Spirit is prompting us, wanting to transform us. Some people fight it. Some people welcome it. Yeah, but it's still, all the glory still goes to God. Jesus gets the glory for my salvation. The Holy Spirit gets the glory for transforming me. Your, your, your turn to talk. Whose turn? Whoever feels like it. There's only two people. You got a 50-50 chance of, of getting the next turn. You want to flip a coin, Stephen? <laughs> I think I'm good. You can go. Okay. I'll go ahead. Uh, I love everything you guys said. Such great uh, words that we have available to us. The Word of God. And that's the truth. The Word of God is the truth. And the Word of God says... To believe the word of God. Okay, back to you. Okay, anything to add, Stephen, before we move on to 22? Yeah, uh, yes. I like how you said that um, all of us, you know, grow and you know bear fruit, you know, differently in our you know Christian life and in our you know sanctification process and our growing. And I definitely think that's true. Like one thing that I know, like, again, I'm about to bring up, you know, Lordship Salvation again, but well, I hate it when, when you know, you get sa when you're getting saved and when you're believing on Jesus, and then they hold you to a certain standard, like saying that you will do X, 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 and X, and say that, like, like if you're really saved, you'll do all this stuff, and it'll happen, like, fast, when, like, in reality, you know, that's not necessarily true. I mean, I think it's, like, good stuff to do, but, of course, in reality, only believing in Jesus will save someone. I guess one weird analogy I have is, you know, Jesus, we are the vine, and every branch is different, and, you know, some branches are just going to grow at different rates and, you know, produce fruit, you know, at different times. So, and also, of course, we're a body made of many parts, so each of us will function differently. So, I mean... I just don't think it's good to like hold anyone to like any standard, but you know, let them you know seek Jesus and listen to His Spirit, which you must also test, as Jesus said, to try the spirits to make sure it's actually Him speaking to you, His Holy Spirit. But yeah, like growth is definitely very, very important, but it's not a certain standard you should really hold anybody to. Yeah. Uh... I think it's it's true also in the new birth. Uh, I think I mentioned it yesterday or recently that uh, when we come to Jesus, uh, there's not a universal standard way everybody comes to Jesus. Uh, what, what I believed in Jesus, uh, it was because I had a heartfelt conviction that Jesus loved me so much that, that I couldn't help but love him in, in return. And other people, they have a heartfelt conviction that uh, 
uh, you know, they, they're, they're a sinner and they're just dis in despair and contrite and brokenhearted over their sinfulness and they are thanking Jesus for paying for their sins and saving them from hell. So it wasn't sin and hell that was really on my mind. It was love and a relationship with God that, that drew me. And is one more valid than the other uh, as far as your what inspires you to come to Jesus? Uh, that problem is that some people, they have a particular experience and they want to make it the standard experience. Everybody must do it. They have the same kind of tears. I had tears, but they weren't tears of contrition. They were tears of joy of the love of, from when I learned about the love of Jesus. But someone else, they have tears of contrition, and they're going to question you. And if you didn't have tears of contrition, they're going to challenge whether you are truly saved. Uh, so our our new birth experience is unique. And, and also, after we get saved, our spiritual growth patterns are unique. And that's the problem, is that people are trying to impose a universal standard on everybody. I'll go on unless you want to say anything else about that. Okay, KJV, verse 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Uh, for John was not yet cast into prison. That's uh, 22 through 24. Now a person might think, you know, when it says here in verse 23, no, in verse 22 it says, and there, uh, and after these things, Jesus, no, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. Uh, so maybe some people will get the impression that Jesus is performing baptisms there. Uh, and then it says John was also baptizing nearby too. John was not yet in prison. Uh, I'll read in the Amplified in a minute, but let me get your reaction to that so far. I thought I read somewhere that uh, Jesus was baptizing... Uh... But I never uh, contemplated it. It just uh, went in and out. Uh, was there another passage somewhere that infers that uh, Jesus did baptisms? Uh, I think we're going to find a verse that saying that Jesus never baptized anybody. Uh, but that's why that's why I mentioned it here because this verse, a person could say, "See, Jesus is performing baptisms." But it doesn't explicitly say Jesus is performing baptisms. It's saying that they're performing baptisms, and Jesus is there, but is he doing it? Uh, I think there's another verse we're going to come to that specifically says that he never baptized anyone, if I remember correctly. And so I'll read it again. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. Uh, it, it's not explicitly saying Jesus performed any baptisms, but I, I, as I said, I think we're going to see a verse where it says he did never baptize anyone, but I, I, I'm just going by my memory. Uh, okay, Brother Stephen. Okay, there's the mic. Um, well, looking at the, like those verses, how he said he came into the land of Judea and Terry with him and baptized, I mean, I guess I'm not going to say too much about, like, Jesus performing baptisms here, but I think maybe it's just talking about, you know, just more people, you know, coming to faith in Jesus and that, you know, he's with them and, you know, bringing them to faith in him at this time. And it's just recognizing that because all throughout the Gospels it's talking about people being added to the belief. All right, let me see if the Amplified has anything to say about that. In verse 22, it says, um, 
uh, app. Now this is not, no, it's no longer in red. So this is no longer the words of Jesus. It says, after these things, Jesus and his disciples went into the land of Judea, and there he spent time with them and baptized. Now John was also baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was an abundance of water. Well, there was an abundance of water there, and people were coming and were being baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Uh, it doesn't really help us, does it? Uh, the Amplified does not expound on that at all. But either one of those, you could get the impression that Jesus is performing baptisms, and I seem to remember that he never did. So we'll have to we'll have to wait till we get to that point, I guess. Let me go on now in the KJV, verse 25. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth. And all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from above. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. Uh, let me stop there. It seems also that uh, verse 26 also supports the idea that maybe Jesus is baptizing. Uh, before I go to the Amplified, anything to say about that? Uh, apparently, uh, one of the disciples or and Jews are testifying that Jesus is baptizing that's what it seems to say but it's not explicitly saying Jesus is performing the baptisms maybe I'm wrong uh, did you guys uh, have any idea on this before I brought this up uh, I believe I read uh, I've read the scriptures over and over again, and it comes to my mind that it says Jesus never performed any baptisms, but maybe I'm wrong. I guess I don't really know too many specifics about that one verse that said he never baptized, but I guess we'll figure that out kind of when we get there. It's just I just don't recall it right now. Okay. Let's go, go on and read this now in the Amplified verse... Uh, starting with verse uh, 24, verse 25, I mean. Therefore, there arose a controversy between John's disciples and a Jew in regard to purification, that's uh, ceremonial washing. So they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, teacher, the man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan at the Jordan River crossing and to whom you have testified, look, he is baptizing too, and everyone is going to him. John replied, a man can receive nothing. He can claim nothing at all, unless it has been granted to him from heaven, for there is no other source than the sovereign will of God. Sounds like the maybe there are some uh, Calvinists on the uh, Amplified Translation Committee. Um, you yourselves are my witnesses that I stated I am not the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, but I have only been sent ahead of him as his appointed forerunner and messenger to announce and proclaim his coming. All right. So that's, we're up to verse 29 now. Uh, this one seems to be more clear that uh, claiming that Jesus is performing the baptisms in the Amplified. I'm still not convinced it's true, and I, I believe there's a verse that says otherwise. Um, okay, let me go to the KJV verse 30. Um, verse 29. Uh, well, I better end it here. Let me end it here. We'll pick up with verse 21 next. I just noticed the time. We're getting close to 8. So I'm going to go John 3, 
verse 29. That's where we'll, we'll go next time. Um, the reason I'm stopping abruptly is, as usual, uh, I'm trying to keep these broadcasts to about an hour, and I want to make sure I have time left in the end to uh, uh, tell people the good news about the free gift of salvation. So let's not neglect that. Before I do, though, I want to give each of you uh, whatever time you need to kind of summarize your thoughts on the study for today. Whoever wants to go first, go. Well, Brother Luke, I hate to leave those red letters. They're such a blessing. I wish we could go back over them again. Okay, back to you. Okay, Brother Stephen? Yeah, I mean, this was yeah, definitely a lot. Looking at, you know, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth... Oh, wait, sorry. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. You know, it's just about looking at, you know, believing in Jesus, you know, for all of your salvation rather than any of yourself. And that, you know, the light has come into the world, you know, that Jesus was here, and then people just love their own, you know, ways of, you know, self-righteousness, not just necessarily doing, you know, wrong things. And, of course, those people also that do with evil hate at the light because they'll be exposed for their self-righteousness, you know, and their hearts. And, of course, as we see, you know, Jesus and his disciples coming in and baptizing, I know we had our debate about whether Jesus performed any baptisms. We'll clarify that in the future, but... I mean, this is just really big because, like, I guess I'm going to be present it slightly a little bit of what you're about to say, but, I mean, the gospel of Jesus, it's just, it's an amazing gift that Jesus has given us. You know, he gave his all for us. You know, instead of us trying to build our way up to God, you know, he came down here and did it for us. He paid the ultimate price. You know, just think about it, the God of this entire universe throughout all the stars, the Milky Way, and the galaxies, came down here in the form of a man, you know, in the form of a helpless baby, you know, grew up while doing the will of God, you know, preaching, you know, shutting down the Pharisees and, you know, showing that and proving that he was the Son of God by not only doing miracles but by rising again after his death and proving that his word was true. And, of course, also, also through the prophecies that he also gave, such as the destruction of the temple. But he showed that his word was true, and he guaranteed us you know, everlasting life for just believing on him. And the fact that he was willing to, you know, to be crucified you know, and die in our place just to save us, it's just an amazing gift that just brings you to me and you know, everyone out there. You know, a lot of you are just worrying, looking at your own works and seeing how you fall short. Stop looking at your own works and look to Jesus, you know, and be saved. Well, thank you, brother. That was a beautiful uh, gospel message there. Uh, uh, the only thing I want to uh, add to it, nothing really needs to be added to it, but I, I always like to emphasize this, this fact that uh, uh, almost everybody in the world today and almost everybody that's ever lived in the world did not understand what you just said. The, 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 the philosophy of the world has always been that um, if we go to heaven, it's, it's because of good behavior. Heaven is a reward for good behavior. It's, it's what I call the merit system. We go to heaven based upon personal merit. If you're good, you go to heaven. If you're not so good or not good enough, you end up in hell. And that's what the world thinks as a whole today. Even much of Christendom thinks that. If you were to ask all the people in the world who identify themselves as Christian of some kind, you ask them, what do you have to do to go to heaven? And they're going to say, what, it's, it's based upon me being good enough. Uh, I've got to go to church. I've got to be baptized. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And then I've got to keep my fingers crossed and hoping it's good enough. 
even most people who are Christians, that's how they see it because they've never studied the Bible or the truth. What, what I call biblical Christianity. Not the Christianity you're going to learn in most, most churches, not the Christianity that you learn in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, so that's the first thing we want to understand is the philosophy of the world is, is all wrong. It even tells us in Romans 10.3 that uh, they're, they're, they're seeking to attain their own righteousness, uh, attain heaven through, their, through uh, building their own righteousness. But it says that's not God's way. God's way is believing in Jesus and having his righteousness credited to you. So um, there's a verse in the Bible that says the way that seems right to men uh, is not God's way. I, I don't think I quoted it perfectly, but uh, uh, what seems logical and right to us is, is not the way God is, is dealing with us. God's dealing with us with, with amazing grace. So uh, the truth is you cannot go to heaven through your personal merit. Uh, the, the standard that a person would have to achieve if they wanted to go to heaven based on their own efforts, the standard is perfection. You can't just be 51% good. You can't just be 90% good. You can't even be 99% good. You'd have to be 100% good. Can you say that you're perfect? Can you say that you've been perfect every moment of your life? If you haven't, that means you fell short. You fell short of perfection. The Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. So if you're going to try to get to heaven on your own through your own efforts, by being religious, you, you've got to understand that is futility. It's impossible. And I hope that when you understand that, you throw up your hands in defeat and say, it's impossible. I need help. I need someone to save me. And the Bible says there's one Savior. It's Jesus Christ. So if you will call on the name of the Lord Jesus, put your faith in Jesus instead of believing in your own efforts, that's when he gives you the gift of salvation. So uh, being able to live in heaven forever is not a reward for good behavior. Being living, able to live in heaven forever is a free gift that Jesus offers all of us. All you've got to do is believe he has the power to give it to you and accept it. That's true. Now... To sum this up, Jesus is God, and he became a man so that he could die for our sins. He paid for all of our sins, and then he was buried, and then he raised himself from the dead bodily. And he walked among witnesses for 40 days. Over 500 people saw him, talked with him, ate with him, touched him. He raised himself the dead to prove his claims. He proved he's God. He proved it that he does have power over life and death. And he's, he's offering us all life everlasting as a free gift. So when Brother Stephen said, use the word gospel, all that, that's just a, a fancy Greek word. And the Greek word means literally good news. So what we're telling you is the good news is that heaven is offered to you as a free gift. Put your faith in Jesus. He gives you heaven as a free gift. I hope you do it now. If you do it, make a comment on this video, please. Uh, all right, brothers, thank you for joining me tonight. Uh, let's uh, say good night to the, to the audience, each one of you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody, and please, if you haven't, come to Jesus and live. All right. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ. Join us nightly at 7 p.m.